Welcome to the Counting Capital Podcast, presented by Buchanan Street Partners. For informational purposes only and not to be relied on in any manner as legal, business, financial, tax, or investment advice, nothing in this episode is an offer to sell or the solicitation of an offer to buy securities. Join our host, Buchanan Street Chairman Robert Brunswick. Hello, my name is Robert Brunswick, and I'm the chairman of Buchanan Street Partners, a real estate investment management firm. And I'd like to welcome you to our Counting Capital podcast, which we've created to introduce you to real estate investing, investing at large, and individual businesses that we think would be worthy of your attention. It's my great pleasure to introduce you today to Henrik Quanquist, who is the dean of the George Arduous School of Business at Chapman. So with that, Henrik, Good day. It's nice to have you here. I've been looking forward to this. I look forward to it as well. Thank you for hosting me today. Absolutely. We're going to have some fun. So I think the the best way for uh, our listeners to get to know you is if we can um, hear a little bit about your your past. I mean, I just note uh, your pedigree, the Stockholm School of Economics, most outstanding master thesis in finance, University of Chicago, taught at Ohio State University, joined Claremont McKenna, Visiting professorships at Yale, professor of finance at Miami. My gosh, what a resume. Uh, And you're in our own backyard, our community here with Chapman College. It's so great. But tell me a little bit about your career path. Is this a normal path for somebody to become a dean? Share with us your background, please. What is interesting about my, my background is that I don't come from an academic family. So I'm actually the first one in my family that went to college. So then I pursued this wonderful academic career and I'm in the middle of it now, assuming the deanship uh, at the uh, Arduo School of Business and Economics and being really pumped up about being back in Southern California and being at Chapman. But it was a pretty long road for me, not coming from an academic background. You know, my parents were um, Swedish middle class uh, family. We grew up uh, in a small town in, uh, back home in Sweden. And uh, it was one of my professors when I did my master's thesis. He was the one who really introduced me to an academic life, what it could be to have an academic career. And I was really inspired by him. He spent some time at MIT himself. And I learned from him about you know, what it could be like to be an academic. That's how it got started. Yeah, it's a great background uh, frame for all of us. As I think about the skill sets of anybody when they find their passion and do what they do so well, what would you kind of self-reflect on that is key as you think about your expertise, your aptitude that has lent itself so well to you teaching and now this deanship? I think, I mean, while I don't come from a family of academics, I come from a family with a lot of people that have worked very hard and that's, I think, one of my skill sets. I'm, I'm very dedicated when I do something. I want to do it well, and I invest all my time and energy and efforts into the different projects that I do. And as an academic career, now I'm the dean of the business school here at Chapman, but before I was a researcher and academic, then I had to publish. It's uh, saying is publish or perish, right? And I went through that, and I guess I published... Uh, and that was, you know, a wonderful uh, experience, but it's tough. Uh, for many of the top journals that we have as academics to target and to publish in, the probability of publishing there is maybe one out of 20 or 5% chance to get your paper in there in those journals. So you have to really have the passion, you have to have the commitment, the drive. And, uh, and I did that for a number of different years, and um, I, I did it successfully. And then uh, the next step for me was to have a bigger impact other than just the the papers that I write and publish. Now I have an impact on a broader set of stakeholders from our students to our alumni, to our professors, our staff, uh, and the community at large as well here in Southern California. So so let's talk about that. You you set it up perfectly. What does it mean to be a dean? Because I think about um, if you're a teacher, you're, you're playing the sport of football. You're the quarterback. You get to control the game. Now all of a sudden it seems like you're moved to the sidelines as the head coach or the GM or the owner upstairs. You're not teaching anymore, I assume. So what does it mean to be a dean? And what's that role? Define that. I think for business people, the best way of understanding being a dean is sort of like being the CEO. Uh, You you know, you have at a private school, you have a P&L responsibility. 
Uh, and you have to make sure that you do everything right from the marketing so that you get students into the different programs. You provide accurate information about all the wonderful things that will happen to our students when they graduate. That's sort of the marketing side of our business. But then there's also the, it's the operational side of it to make sure that you have efficiency, that you run the school in an efficient way. Uh, and so it has sort of the, 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 that, that part of it as well. And then the finance and accounting side of it, you have to make sure that you are in a robust financial situation. Uh, and so that's, there's many different things that you have to balance as the dean. Uh, and, uh, and sort of the way to think about it is, is sort of the CEO role. You know, also, we also bring in resources for our students. We do that not only through uh, tuition. We're a private school, so that is something that is important to us. But also fundraising. Supporters in Southern California, in Orange County, and beyond that is sponsoring us financially, contributing so that we can do many things for our students. That's also the responsibility that ultimately falls uh, on, the, uh, on the CEO or the dean. Well, I bet you do well at that because uh you articulate the role very well. As I think about all, you know, the, the self-reflection on the ROI of your efforts to mankind or the particular role you have, do you feel you have made more influence and a bigger ROI as a dean than you might have as a teacher? I mean, I think it's, for me, it's sort of a natural progression of my career. And I had a wonderful research career. I got an opportunity to travel around the world, literally to most different universities that you have ever heard about, including some that you probably never heard about, and disseminate and present, discuss, talk about the research in behavioral finance, which is my area. Uh, and I did that for a number of years, and I got good at it, I was successful at that. But at some point, I, I wanted to do something a little bit different. And, uh, and Chapman provided an amazing opportunity for me. I'm, an, I'm sort of entrepreneurial in my mindset, and I like to innovate and to do, build something, uh, starting with a base that previous generations have built at Chapman, and then take that to the next uh, level. As a real estate guy, we had an amazing foundation to build on, but now it's about begin, building one more uh, level and then another level, and uh, all the way up to, to the top rankings where we think that we will belong in a couple of years. Excellent, I love the aspirations. So. As I looked at your Wikipedia, I thought about and reflected on your passion for research, your aptitude for research, and at a very high level. So how do you satisfy that passion you must have had, and, and moreover, that capability in the deanship? Yeah, the, it's, it's, it's tough. You know, the day has only 24 hours, and we need to sleep a few as well, right? right. So how do you do all of this? I think um, I, I still try to be connected with uh, research. Uh, now also on the consumer side, if I'm not producing research myself, I try to consume the research that my colleagues that are, they are producing, which is wonderful, and try to feature and promote some of their research on our social media for the school or to get it out there to the general public as well. What do I do personally? I actually, I do still, I'm still involved with a couple of different research projects. They are mainly driven by my research team members. I try to, you know, do my, my fair share. Uh, I'm also a part of editing a book right now that will uh, come out later on, on on fintech and blockchain and a few topics that actually I didn't know too much about myself, but by being part of the, the team that is editing the book, I learned a few things. And, at the end of the day, as a professor, as a teacher, as a dean, I went into this line of business because I love to learn new things, uh, explore new pathways that people previously, they may perhaps not have explored so much in depth. Without putting you on the spot, um, is there a piece of research that you've written, authored, uh, that you feel most proud of, or that you can look back on, say, that it actually had a co contribution outside of its academic setting? I think, uh, yeah, so a couple of different, I would say, pieces. But, you know, each of the papers that we publish as academics, because it's so difficult to create these and publish these papers in the top journals, each of them are sort of like your kids, so you, you like all of them as much. Um, but maybe there are some that just happen to have a little bit of a bigger impact. I would say I wrote a number of different papers together with some of my collaborators on the topic of nature versus nurture. Oh. So what shapes you as a 
decision maker in the domain of finance? Are you driven when it comes to taking risk? Is that because of you know, uh, nature, because you were born to be more conservative or born to be more of a risk taker? Or is it because of the family environment that you grew up in, uh, you know, the nurture part? And so we wrote a number of different papers on these topics and they have been quite well cited by other academics and it's also been some, 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 uh, some media exposure for these papers and, uh, and that's been very rewarding. You shouldn't have brought that one topic up because I recently saw a movie about triplets that they were all adopted by different families. And these triplets all had a different nurture, but all had the same nature. And there was a, uh, an outcome to the belief of one over the other. So what was your outcome? Exactly, so actually we find that it's both nature and nurture because they are not exclusive. So we find though that uh, if you look at across a broad sample of different people, then about a third or about 30% or so of the variation in say risk taking across different people, that's attributable to your DNA, to your genes, to the nature part of it. And to your point about the triplets, all of my work that I did worked on, we used data on identical and fraternal twins. My gosh. Actually from my home country, from Sweden, uh, because we have a very uh, solid record keeping of uh, all the twins in my country. Shocking. <laughs> <laughs> I like the preciseness. Um, so I'm now, you mentioned Sweden, so it's good transition for us. How much you, how much you kind of reflect on your experience in growing up in Sweden and the educational system and process versus what you experience here in the US? I mean, I, I think first of all, one of the differences is, is that we, when I grew up in Sweden, we had only public schools. So I'm a product of the public schools in, uh, in Sweden. Um, I was very lucky to have several amazing teachers starting in uh, the first grade uh, and who I stayed in touch with for a long time uh, afterwards because she was very influential for me as a, as a young person, as a student and, and so I was a product of that uh, and I always loved to, uh, to study, learn new things and uh, that's, uh, that's sort of I think ultimately what led me to, to go to uh, study economics and business and then ultimately then go down the academic pathway. But I was earlier in my life, I was considering should I become an engineer or should I go into business and economics. At, at, the, at, at the end of the day, I think social science, I could relate a little bit more to that and that was, that was more my passion rather than uh, en the engineering side. But I had an opportunity to work some of the work that I've done with startups and in venture capital space, I've uh, worked closely with many engineers who are always inspiring to me with their ideas and with their precisions and uh, uh, you know, uh, as, as sort of uh, eyesight on the details. Aside from your responsibility at the Chapman and, and what Chapman speaks to and how it's uh, producing great results, uh, there's a lot of dialogue right now about the evolution of education in our country. And I'm just curious how you reconcile outcomes, whether it's the, you know, the, the, the financial loans and maybe they don't correlate to necessary a financial outcome that would warrant them taking on that liability or just the actual education you get post high school versus maybe where you could get it on the job immediately or in a trade school or whatever the case may be. So is there another uh, view to education as, as we evolve and look at education in our country? I think, uh, first of all, I think uh, one of the things that we have in this country, in the United States, that is really a blessing is that we have a whole array, a whole menu of different educational options. Particularly in California, we have some of the best uh, uh, public uh, research universities are in, uh, in our state. If you look at UCLA, you look at UC Berkeley, that's, that's one part of it. But then you also have amazing uh, private institutions. You have Chapman, of course, that I represent, and we have others here in our state as well. Uh, and we all sort of uh, have uh, different approaches to the mission. Uh, there's different uh, tuitions that are associated with the different schools. From my perspective, the way I measure our success is what is the outcome for the students? Do they get well-paying jobs with great strong brand name employers? 
uh, will they continue to be successful even years after they have left our school? Uh, that is, of course, not only attributable to uh, the experience that they have at our university, but we want to set stu students up for success. We have an entire, at our school, we have an entire career advancement team. That's what we call it, career advancement. Uh, and they help our students launch their careers for the youngest students that we have uh, that are uh, coming straight out of college. And they help other more experienced students accelerate their career. So we launch and we accelerate their careers. And if we do that successfully, then yes, they will have a good ROI on their investment in, in one of our programs. You didn't say it, but I might project that um, it's college, the conventional college might not be for everybody and there are other paths depending on the journey that they're on or what their own aptitudes or desires might be. I, you could almost, I mean, I, I look at it in the supply demand model. We have, it seems more colleges than maybe the demand would warrant if you project out going forward. So imagine there, everyone's not gonna be a survivor in that competition for that student. Is that, is that fair as you guys think about, I mean, Chapman will probably be a survivor, but there are many that probably won't. Is that fair? Uh, definitely Chapman not only will be a survivor, we also weathered the, uh, the global pandemic really, really well from a financial perspective. So we have a very strong financial foundation. Um, it's, as you say, demand and supply and uh, th there might be some of the uh, participants in this market, uh, some institutions that will you know, be uh, potentially wiped out uh, and some consolidation, uh, like with any industry. So it's, it's important every day we think also what I manage is the business school. We look at our portfolio of different programs. Do we have the right programs in our portfolio? We have a real estate program, obviously, because sure. of the arduous name. We need to be world class in that space. But we're also looking at what about in the future? So, for example, uh, we are looking to launch uh, down the road a, a new program in business analytics. And because there's a lot of machine learning, artificial intelligence, big data, uh, coding, uh, and that's something that is important to a lot of businesses that have a lot of data to analyze. So we want to be part of educating those students to uh, help businesses make the right decisions. All industries have disruptors. And in this world we live in now with things happening immediately and never you know, seen before, um, what is the disruption that's taking place or you project will take place in the education delivery model? I think it, certainly as a result of COVID, there's a lot more attention now to online and the role of online. Uh, and I think that has really made a big impact on a lot of different programs. If you look at MBA programs, which a lot of business schools are known for, there are more students in online MBA programs now than ever before. Of course, the competition is also very, very strong uh, in that space, meaning you have a lot of uh, schools that are delivering online education. Now, we are Chapman. We have one of the most beautiful campuses in, uh, in this country, and I've visited many of them. So if you are growing up, you're learning about yourself, about how to communicate, how to acquire new skills, and you're around 20 years old, uh, it, what is a better environment than coming and spending some time in, in Orange, California at Chapman, which is a, a safe environment for a lot of students? So that's sort of, I think that that model will be there in the future for undergraduate education. I don't see any significant threat to that model. What we have to look at is for uh, our students that are a little bit more experienced, say you're in your 30s, you're starting a family, you have a job that demands a lot from you, then we have to see what role may online education play. Maybe not purely online, because a lot of students, they love to come to a beautiful campus and get that feeling, even though they may be 35 years old, but to have some uh, of the uh, education being delivered through online, that is definitely a trend, and I believe it's a trend that is here to stay. And it's important to a lot of schools, a lot of deans, to think about how exactly will that play out. And it will also depend on your geographical location. We happen to be in a geographically extremely um, a attractive place in Southern California where a lot of people, they go to vacation. Uh, but there's other schools that have been in 
geographically a little bit more challenging places and some of them had then decided to go down the path of becoming some of the leaders in online education. So it is, if you're innovative, if you're creative, I think that there's, there's a role for a lot of great universities in the future as well. So you mentioned before, I like the way you frame the, P, you now have P&L responsibility. So as you think about a P&L responsibility, is it to break even each year? Um, is, and how much is of your um, overhead is offset by philanthropy versus we'll just call it the admissions process of the students that you oversee. If you can just share broadly the math model. And I think, uh, you know, maybe without going into too many details, I mean, there's, uh, the, the fundraising aspect is extremely important to us at, uh, at Chapman. We're in the middle of our campaign now. It's a half a billion dollar campaign, $500 million that Chapman University. That's is the greater the, university. The greater university okay. that we're targeting to, uh, to uh, raise. Uh, and, in, and the way I think about it is that just because you're a nonprofit, so while we are a private university, we are still a nonprofit. The more efficient we can be, the better we can do things financially, the more resources will be available to our students, to our alumni, to invest in them. We don't have shareholders like uh, you have in the publicly traded companies, but we still have stakeholders. And the better we can be with running our programs in an efficient, responsible way, the more resources will be left over for scholarships, uh, to different uh, co-curricular activities, uh, different competitions that we do for the students with other schools, and all that good stuff that we have, both for our undergraduate students and for our master's students as well. So, Henrik, I would assume this is your first deanship, correct? That's right. Okay. So what do you, what's the favorite aspect of your job as you've now entered this next stage in your career? What do you like most that you do? I think one thing that as the dean you have the, it's really the pleasure that you have is to meet with so many great people from many different kind of walks of life. So you have, if you look at, we have students that are extremely outstandingly smart uh, they are very, they are brilliant, they are talented, but they may come from a very challenging background. But because they are so smart and talented, we are able to give them a great scholarship. And it's, it's rewarding to see them grow, come into a private institution like ours and see them grow and succeed. And then if you look at the other side of that equation, you have the donor, someone that has done well with their life, with their business. Uh, they may be a Chapman graduate or not, but they have decided to give us some of their resources that they have, that they're able to do that, and to be able to work with them as well, to bring together those that need those resources and those that have them and can sponsor our students. That's one of the things that I enjoy the most. And you, you really get an opportunity to meet a large number of different people from all sorts of different backgrounds. So I'm getting a sense it's the variety of, of audible calling and activities that you're kind of involved I enjoy with. that. Sure. So <clears throat> with that, and I know you're quite content at Chapman, but what is a natural progression of someone in your career path? I mean, where do you go from a Chapman? How does a Chapman keep you? I mean, you're still a very young man, and uh, you've got obviously lots of skill and aptitude and I'm sure ambition. So where, where, where do, where's the next road look like for you? So to transform a business school, really, it's not done overnight, so it takes a long period of time, uh, years, it can take decades. I mean, if you look at Chapman as one of the examples, so Jim Doty, who is very well known in Orange County and beyond, uh, who was the president at Chapman for 25 years. I and, you. you know, during that period of time, look at Chapman, that used to be Chapman College, by the way, and that was then made into Chapman University, and then has added, expanded the number of students that are on our campus. Now we have a campus also in Irvine. We have an engineering school, which we didn't have five years ago. And so to, to really transform an institution, whether that is at the university level or at the business school level that I am, that's something that takes time, even if we work really, really hard, even if you're a little bit impatient, like I am, right. uh, it still takes some time, and, and, and I'm, I'm really, really happy to, to do that and, and get that, uh, that trust and that opportunity by the university and by all of our stakeholders to help out uh, steer uh, this school, this fantastic school, to, to the next level. That's great. Well, they're lucky to have you. Uh, it's quite, it says a lot about Chapman to kind of 
be able to recruit, retain, and, and, and nurture this, this talent that, that you brought to us um, and yourself. Uh, I think as we kind of wind up our, our time today, um, I'd love you to kind of provide to those people that are listening that might have aspirations to teach, that might have aspirations to be a dean someday, kind of, or, or just in general getting into the academic world as a profession, if you will. What, what uh, comments might you have for them or suggestions? For sure. I would say my path was that I was really excited about one particular topic that was finance and economics. So I started out when I went to college by connecting with one of the best professors at my school. I started out working as his research assistant, learning to know a little bit about uh, what is an academic career about. Because remember, I don't come from this, so uh, no one told me in my home what it would be like to be a professor. To sort of uh, also mention that being a professor is a lot more than teaching. So now as a dean, I'm not uh, teaching at the moment because I have to stay focused on all the other things that I do. But even when I did teach, uh, I would say probably I devoted only about uh, one quarter to one third of my time to teaching. Of course, I taught uh, the best possible courses that I could uh, uh, do, but I also spent a lot of time on, on the research, thought leadership, uh, the schools where I was, putting them on the map so that uh, people in the world of academia and beyond, they would know about that uh, thought leadership and that, that research that was created by myself and by my co-authors and getting this out there, not only in the academic journals, but in Wall Street Journal, being on CNBC or all those different things that uh, you know, some of us as professors, we have had an opportunity to do. And uh, it can be a really amazing career. A lot of people only know about the professors from the classroom perspective, but there's a lot more to it and it can be a lot of fun. So I think for those that are in the business and want to continuously learn new things, it's an amazing career, at least it's been for me. I want to thank Dean Cronquist for participating with us today. It was perfect. Uh, I think we got a lot of thought leadership about the world of academia, uh, what's it like to be a dean, and I'm sure you've got lots of good learning from this session today, and I appreciate you spending the time with us. And we're going to look forward to having you on our next podcast of Counting Capital. Thank you very much. Thank you for joining us on this episode of the Counting Capital podcast. To learn more about Buchanan Street Partners, please visit our website at buchananstreet.com. Buchanan Street Partners, capital you can count on.